Greetings once again as we continue our study of the book of Ephesians. We welcome you and uh, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are very, very concerned about your church being a vital force in this world in which we live. To be a positive influence, to reach out to many, many people. Lord, we are people ourselves and as we gather as the church, we don't find that we are qualified or perfect in ourselves, but we ask you to coordinate us and pull our efforts together that we work in harmony with your will, with your words, and reach out to the world around us to bring your presence to be a source of strength for all of us. We ask your guidance now in this chapter four of our study today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> So as we continue on, uh, we are looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we are kind of subtitling that, God's letter to the church. Let me quickly, briefly summarize. Chapter 1 was being the church on purpose as God gathered Jews and Gentiles together to be the church. Chapter 2, uh, he built, builds his church, and we saw how God is working to do that. Uh, chapter 3 last week was uh, God's power made known through the church. We've got a message to bring out to the world around us. And chapter 4 today is the coordinated, uh, cooperating body of Christ. We together working to uh, use the unity and to gain the unity of faith that God is offering to us. Okay. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, in chapter 3, Paul had already addressed this, that he was a prisoner for their sake. He's not uh, laying a guilt trip on them. He's not trying to uh, make them feel bad. But he's trying to say, this is serious stuff. You could, in your life as a follower of Jesus, you could end up on the wrong side of the law. You could end up on the wrong side of the authorities. But it's worth it for what we gain. So he's gladly, as a prisoner for the Lord, he's standing as a representative for the calling. And even though we can't see this so clearly in English, in these first two verses, there's, a, there's really a, a triple, triple mentioning of the word call or calling. Now, bear in mind that the word church in the Greek language is ekklesia. Now, we get the word ecclesiastical or ecclesiastes is related to that. But ek means out of and klesia means to call. So you and I as Christian people, as we've put our trust in Jesus Christ, we are called out of this world to be followers of Jesus. And that is the church, called out ones, ecclesia. So when Paul says in verse 1, I urge you, that word urge has a uh, kind of a different, uh, different twist to it, but the same meaning, I'm calling you, I'm urging you. And, and he's urging them to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. So I don't... Don't, I want to remind you of the fact that uh, in chapter one, in, in week one of our study, I said there are three characteristic words uh, or positions as we work through the book of Ephesians. We sit, we walk, and we stand. In the first part, we, uh, we, we learned in chapter two that we are already now part of us by our relationship with Jesus Christ, part of us is already seated in the heavenly places. Now, that's a mystery that we can't fully comprehend at this time, but we've got our reservations in heaven. We're sitting at the right hand of God with Jesus. Today really focuses on the walking part. We live out our faith as we continue to live in this world. I urge you, I call you to walk in a worthy manner according to the calling so that that terminology, the calling, 
That's call out of the world, called to be the church. The calling to which you have been called. We're not to just choose our own lifestyle. We can walk worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ, recognizing that we are constantly models of Christianity. We can either cause people to shake their heads and say, if that's what a Christian is, I don't want to be one of them. Or they've got something that I don't have and I want to know what it is. We're walking according to a calling to be different for our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to walk, verse 2 goes on to say, we are to walk with all humility and gentleness, not a little bit of humility, but all humility, all gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Okay, perhaps you've heard me say this before. If you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because you will wreck that perfect church. We're not perfect people. And so if we're going to be involved with one another's lives as the gathered ones, the called out ones, we have to, uh, we have to relate to one another. And we're not perfect people. And so... Listen to these words, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another. Um, let, let me read you a statement here that uh, kind of capsulizes this. We're not perfect people. We're not easy to get along with. What we need is a thick skin, kid gloves, even tempers, blinders, a strong grip, white knuckles, unending motivation, and it wouldn't hurt to throw in a bottle of extra strength, et cetera, and so we can get along with one another. It takes effort to be the church, to be united. We won't, don't have a shortage of people that are out there somewhere that used to be part of the church, but they have wandered off. They've been broken off of the fellowship, the unity, the gatherings, because they've been hurt by something or someone. Um, let me just share, share with you a, a theme or a thought that I, I had years ago. I wrote an article about this. It was uh, five minutes at the mic. And I was just sort of dreaming that if I could have five minutes at a microphone where I could re reach all the people of the world in their own language at the same time, what would I say in those five minutes? <laughs> Rather hypothetical, isn't it? What would you say? Well, my determination was I would take three minutes to very carefully, very completely describe who Jesus is, what he did, what it means for us, the value of our salvation for now and time and for all of eternity. But with those last two minutes at the microphone, I would strongly urge people not to let anyone else keep them out of heaven. Let all those hurts of the past, let all those looks, all those glances, all those uh, feelings of betrayal or, or being let down, just let them go. Don't let some other person keep you out of heaven. We need God's Spirit to bring us together in spite of ourselves. We are the church. Humility, gentleness, Patience, bearing one another with one another, but always in love. That's the highest form of love in the Greek language, agape love, a sacrificial love, where we would be willing to go out of our way, to lay our life on the line for those that we are called together with. We go on to verse 3. We've got all these bumps in the roads as we relate to one another. But as we get over our squabbles and differences, the smoke clears, the cloud is gone, and we can see perfectly that we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. 
Okay. Hold on like a bulldog, eager to hold on, to cling to, to value highly a unity which has already been given to us. And that's the unity of the Spirit of God coming down from above. We don't have to create that. We don't have to make it happen. It exists already. All we have to do is remember that we are united in the Spirit. There's a oneness that is there. It's called the bond of peace. The word bond means that we're locked into it. You know, if you uh, made an investment and you uh, were looking for the best interest rate, and they tell you that if you uh, lock in for uh, 18 months, you can lock into that rate, and no matter what happens with the stock market, you're guaranteed that rate of return. You're locked in. This unity of the Spirit locks us in to the peace of God, which passes all understanding, because it sees past ourselves, and it looks to the higher calling, our calling to be the church through our faith, which is already unified by the Spirit who gives us this unity. And we have to be eager to maintain that, to not let it slip away from us, to not ignore it or deny it or not even be aware of it. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Now, keep that thought in mind because we're going to hear something closely related that we don't already have, but it's going to sound very similar. Going on to verse 4. Very prominent mentioning of the word one, the number one. There is one body and one spirit. The body of Christ is unified. We've already talked about this, that Jesus heads up all things. He's, that's that uh, Greek word, anakaphaliasis. He's the head over all things, and all of us are connected. It's like the New Testament version of the dry bones of Ezekiel 37 that we are the body of Christ. We've come together in him. And there is one body and there's one Holy Spirit. We don't have many other Holy Spirits that are taking us in different directions. This is that unity that already exists in the bonds of peace. Um, verse 4. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. There it is again, the word call. One hope. We are not given Aladdin's lamp. We're not, uh, we're not just uh, told, wish for anything that you want. You can dream big. You can hope for the stars. No, we're hoping for what God has already promised to us. We're hoping for the fulfillment or the manifestation of what God in his holy word has made available to us. Uh, Peter tells us that all things that pertain to life and godliness have been revealed to us in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and of God our Father. Everything that pertains to life and godliness, it's all been revealed through that one spirit. One call. We've got one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, we don't have many masters. Remember the word teaches, uh, no man can serve two masters. He will love the one and hate the other, or vice versa. One Lord Jesus Christ, one faith. That knocks a hole right into that theory that says uh, there are many ways to get to heaven. You know, that's what uh, different religions claim. Uh, the Hindus, the uh, you know, the Muslims, everybody has their own, own path to what they call heaven. But that's not what our Bible teaches us. There's only one faith, and there's one Lord, and that one faith is in Jesus Christ. One baptism. Uh, that baptism has different phases to it. There was the baptism of John for the repentance of sins, there's baptism in the name of, of Jesus or the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that a little bit more in chapter 5 next week. 
But it's all together, three phases, but one baptism. One God, one Father of us all. And he is in charge over all. He is through all. And he's in all. God is the final answer. And so, verse 7 goes on to say, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, verse 7 is going to really uh, be, be clarified as we, as we look at the next verses. So uh, it comes first, but it's also, also kind of in sequence here. It says that Christ gave each one of us grace according to the measure of his gift. Um, God's grace, in the Greek word, is charisma. It means a gift of grace, and that's what exactly it's talking about here. And so we want to see the order and the timing of this. Uh, going on to verse 8, therefore it says, When he, Jesus, ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So Jesus comes down from heaven. He lives in the flesh, the incarnation, for 33 years. And we know as we recite in the creed that he, was, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. Well, he died on a Friday. And the third day, Sunday, he rose again. And 40 days later, he ascends back to heaven. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus goes back to heaven. Now, this is a grand insight that we've talked about uh, several times before. When he went back to heaven, when he ascended, he led a host of captives. Now, what does that mean? In the Old Testament times, the sins of people were covered, covered with the blood of animals, bulls, goats, sheep, turtle doves, pigeons, different sins, different sacrifices, but sins were covered. In the New Testament, when Jesus comes down as the very Son of God in human form, the very next day after he was baptized, the first day of his public ministry, if you want to say it that way, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming back down to the Jordan River and he, he, he points to the one coming and he says, I want you all to behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb, the sacrifice that God provided, who takes away the sins of the world. He's not going to cover them over with animal blood. He's going to, with the shedding of his blood, Scoop those sins up and take them away. Think of the difference between covering a pile of garbage and hauling it away to the dump. Big difference. Jesus hauled away our sins on Calvary's cross. Ironically, the hill, Skull Hill, Golgotha as we know it, was Jerusalem's town dump. And in a very sad and sadistic sort of way, that was the Roman mentality. Let's get rid of the trash of our society out there at the public dump. Jesus hauled our sins to the dump. Now, in Old Testament times, there were faithful people that believed God's promises, and there were people who didn't believe in God. So when they died... What happened to them? Their bodies fell into the ground, but their spirits went to the realm of the dead. We could think of them as prisoners of war, captives of war, the warfare of sin in our world. And they were captives in this realm of the dead, which had two separate places to it. There was a great gap fixed between them, and on one side, it was a place called paradise 
When Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, that's where Jesus and the thief went. But the other side, on the other side of this gap, was a place of torment. You can read about that in, in Luke chapter, chapter 16, um, verses 19 through 31. Quite, a, quite an interesting story. But Jesus, during that Friday, uh, late hours of Friday, Saturday, and before Easter Sunday, when he rose from the grave, he went down into that realm of the dead. He announced, you can read about this in 1 Peter, he announced to the spirits who were doomed, he sealed their doom for them, but to those who had put their faith in God, the faithful saints of the Old Testament, they were now released from their prison, even though it was a paradise. And that's the reference here in Ephesians chapter 4. He led a host of captives on high. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus went back to heaven and he took the Old Testament saints with him. Now, forgive me for this illustration. But it's like between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is, they're like a tag team mat, wrestling match now. So in the heavenly realms, there was a point in time in which God the Father said to Jesus, his precious son, son, I want you to go down there in that world. You're going to suffer. You're going to be like them in every respect without sin. But I want you to pay for their sins. I want you to take them away. I want you to rescue humanity. So Jesus left heaven, and he was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And then he ascended back to heaven, and he tagged the Holy Spirit, who 10 days later on the day of Pentecost would, be, would fill, uh, fill the world and would be poured out upon all flesh, upon all those who would believe in Jesus. And so through the Holy Spirit's presence now, Jesus went back to heaven, his presence was gone, but the Holy Spirit, a spirit without a body, who's not limited to being in one place at one time, can be with you and you and you, every one of us, wherever we go to the ends of the earth. That's how Jesus fulfills his promise, I'm going to be with you. My spirit will be with you to the ends of the earth, to the close of the age. And so he gave gifts to men. That's what verse 8 is all about. Verse 9, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? And that, again, is the two places, paradise and the place of torment. He descended there, announcing the doom to those and uh, setting the captives free to the others. He descended, uh, also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And that's where Jesus is now. Uh, seated at the right hand of God, filling all things. All things are subjected unto him. And as we go on with this, boy, I wish you were present. I could ask if you have any questions. Uh, give me a call or send me an email if you want to find out more about that. We're still looking, he gave gifts to men. And verse 11 describes those gifts. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors, and teachers. I saw an illustration one time uh, years ago using the left hand to get this point across. The apostles are like the thumb we have such great flexibility. The thumb is really the foundation of the hand, isn't it? But the apostles are like the thumb. They go out like the Apostle Paul and start creating churches and stirring up people to believe. And they break new ground. Today we don't talk about apostles as much as we talk about missionaries who are sent out. Apostles and then prophets, they are like the pointer finger of God giving specific messages to encourage, to help, to build up other people. 
the evangelists are like the middle finger that reaches out the farthest out into the world. Uh, just think of the tremendous influence that Billy Graham had during his years of ministry in this world. He reached out into all the world. The pastor is like the ring finger. The pastor is married to the church, to the people that he's serving. And the teacher is like the little finger because it goes farthest into the ear. Well, I hope that illustration helps you to visualize this a little bit. These ministry gifts were given to the church. They are the spiritual leaders. And now, why were, why were they given? What was their purpose? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. First of all, the word to equip. If you look at the Greek word to do a study of that word, it really means to set a bone. Okay? So these spiritual leaders are, are sent as a gift from God, from Jesus, to the church to set things straight that are broken, that are out of order. Different teachings that have infiltrated uh, our, our ways of thinking. Natural thoughts that kind of make more sense to us sometimes in God's spiritual thoughts. And the leaders in the church are to set things in order, set things straight again, setting a bone. Uh, so if there's ever a dif difference of opinion between a pastor and a congregation, I guess uh, from one side or the other, we could say we've got a bone to pick with you. To set things straight. So to equip or to prepare the saints for the work of ministry. I want to use a little illustration here. Depending on what Bible you're using, some of the older translations, the uh, King James, for example, uh, I personally prefer to use my Revised Standard Version. Uh, and those older translations carry with them a comma which makes such a big, big difference. And I want to make a big deal about this big difference. So look at that. Look at verse 12. So apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are to equip the saints. And then those older translations, after the word saints, put a comma there. So it looks like the ministers, the leaders, the spiritual leaders, it looks like, if you put the comma in there, they've got three jobs. To equip the saints for the work of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. Just before we started recording this message today, I went back and double-checked and I looked in the Greek. There is no comma there. It's misplaced. So... This is an accurate reading, at least in the Bible that I'm using today. To equip the saints so that the saints can do the work of ministry. To equip the saints so they, doing the work of ministry, can build up the body of Christ. It's not a matter of saying, well, it's the pastor's job to go out there and bring new members into the church. It's the pastor's job to equip the saints to do the work of ministry, to bring in your family, your friends, uh, people that you're in contact with, and to lead them into the fellowship of the church, that they too could be called out of worldly ways and be part of the message of God's redeeming love. So pastors, pa uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, equip you to do the work to build up the church. Okay. Now, verse 13. Remember, I told you there's going to be a very similar thought to verse 3 coming up. Here it is, verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. How long are we to build up the body of Christ, build up the church? until all of us in the church, until all churches that have their, their different uh, approaches, uh, until we realize that we've got a unity of spirit, but we don't have a unity of faith yet. 
Some churches emphasize things differently than other churches. That doesn't mean they're wrong. It means that they see things slightly different from a different perspective. Maybe they see things that we don't see, can't see yet. As we work together rather than clashing, we can bring our vantage points together and we can start working on the unity of the faith. And that's what God is looking for. And that's what we're, that's what we're anticipating to, to happen. And so, uh, um, until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, the knowledge of the Son of God this doesn't mean that we can, we can uh, do Bible trivia and we know uh, how old was Jesus when he went to the temple the first time. Well, he was 12 years old. How many disciples did Jesus gather? 12. We're not knowing facts about Jesus. We're knowing Jesus. We're known by Jesus. Knowing him as a person, not just knowing about him. That's part of this unity of the faith until we have the knowledge of who Jesus truly is and what he means to each one of us personally and what he means to the church, not only to our congregation, but to all churches who profess their faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we're working towards. We're not there yet, but we've got to continue to work at it just as fervently as we work at maintaining the unity of the spirit that we already possess. And how long until we reach mature manhood? Until we stop acting babyish, self-centered, spoiled, and we grow and we mature in our Christian faith. How much do we need to grow? To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. To grow up to the same measure of Christ. Uh, we've got a ways to go, don't we? But that's the goal. To grow up into Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, in deceitful schemes. Well, that's a mouthful. In our, in our culture, <clears throat> we tend to think of how, uh, how precious and gentle children are, and, and they truly are, but we sometimes fail to remember how helpless they are. They can't feed themselves, they can't protect themselves, they can't change their own diapers. There are a lot of things that children just cannot do. Children, as they're growing up, are putty in the hands of people who will either guide them in a proper way or guide them into bad ways. And if outside influences cause us in our childishness to be listening rather to teachings that make sense by worldly standards, those things are going to rock our boat. They're going to be driving us here and there and everywhere. When I was in college, I had to take a philosophy course. And uh, um, I can remember every day we had to read a different, uh, different focus of a different philosopher. And as I would read that, I would start to say to myself, this guy really makes sense. The next day, we'd read something that completely contradicted that and made even better sense. And, you know, I never knew where I was supposed to be landing until I finally figured it out that these were not Christian philosophies. These were just the opinions of men, and they were driving me here and there and everywhere, driving me crazy. And in our childish ways, if we are paying attention, if we have itching ears that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy, seeking for people to tell us what we want to hear, we're like waves on a sea that are tossed by the winds, by every wind of doctrine, it says here, by every teaching that comes along. 
And when we start to digest them and say, oh, that makes perfect sense to me. But if it contradicts with God's word, that's not good. We should be discerning about that. We're to grow up into mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, not being children any longer, not following human cunning or craftiness and deceitful schemes. Look at our present day and age. Look for how many, how many generations children have been taught the word of God as uh, God the Father being the creator of this world. And we send them off to college and they're told that, no, God doesn't have anything to do with creation. It's all evolution and they, they are absorbed with evolutionary theories. That's exactly what this is talking about. We can't be driven by what sounds good to us. We have to be solidified in what God's word teaches all of us. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head. Our growth comes as we're nurtured on God's word and we're growing into Jesus. He is the control center. He is the brains of this operation. And he sends a message to, to those who are the pointer fingers of God and saying, present this message. He's the one who tells the feet to go on this errand or this mission. He's the one that we're to grow up into. He's the head, and we're to grow up into him. Uh, from him, whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul, in his writings, I can, I can almost imagine he was amused when he was writing these words, but he was trying to describe, well, what, what if the whole body were an eye? Can you imagine that? If you were one great big eyeball, you didn't have any feet, and you had to get from point A to point B, do you realize how much dust you get in your eye getting from point A to point B? Boy, it's a good thing we're not one great big eyeball. So our eyes can't say to our feet, I don't need you. And so every part of the body has got its different function. And we as the body of Christ have different gifts and talents and abilities. But all of it connected to Jesus, the head. And when it's all working properly, we're all going in the same direction. We can't have one leg going this way and one leg going that way, you won't get very far, will you? When it's working properly, it builds itself in love. Okay. So we go on to uh, verse 17. Kind of almost a new subject here. Got a lot of pages of notes here. Paul says to the people now, now this I say and testify in the Lord. That's like, uh, listen up, pay attention now. I'm trying to get your point, this point across. I want your attention, undivided attention. That you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. There's that word walk again, do you see it? Don't go, don't go out there and live like Gentiles do. Now, again, in chapter 2, he's bringing the Gentiles and the Jews together into the church. But he's saying, don't be like Gentiles before they came to faith in Jesus. Gentiles who didn't know the ways of God's love and covenant of the Old Testament. We are to walk in a new way. We are to not be our old self any longer. So Gentiles, by nature, they think through things by natural means, and it's always futility, futility of their minds. Um, we can see this, I hope you can see this clearly. If you could take a person and say they grew up not knowing anything about Jesus, 
But somewhere along the line, they came to know Jesus and they put their trust in Jesus. So if you look at the manner of that person's life before Jesus and look at after that conversion experience, if there's no change between before and after, something is drastically wrong. Paul is urging, don't walk in the old ways. Don't walk in the futile ways that were inherited from your forefathers. Don't walk as though you didn't know who Jesus was or what he did for you. And he goes on to further describe in verse 18, two things. Look at, they are darkened in their understanding. Now, that beautiful passage that Peter writes about how we are God's people. We're going to talk about that next Sunday, as a matter of fact. We're God's people, and we were transferred out of darkness into the marvelous light of the gospel. But people who are walking in their natural state of being are darkened. They're walking in darkness. And secondarily, they are alienated from the life of God. Alienated, separated from God altogether. Because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Due to their ignorance. Um, look at the word ignorance. Just look at it for a while. What's the root of that word? To ignore. To just sort of, this has nothing to do with me. I don't want to pay any attention to that at all. Now, we probably all have heard the word ignoramus. That actually comes from Latin. It's the uh, first person plural ending, which means collectively, we together, we choose to ignore something. That's what an, in, that's what an ignoramus is. Somebody who gathers together with other like-minded people and purposefully chooses to ignore God. And ignorance maintained for a long enough period of time really brings people to that point where uh, they become callous. Ignorance prolonged breeds hardness of heart. And that's a choice. We choose to ignore God. Verse 19. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So it's anything that you want to do, anything that you desire, according to your base human nature, and that's the darkness and the alienation, that uh, uh, we don't want God messing with our life. We don't want God telling us what to do. I want to do what I want to do. I want to give in to my sense, sex, sexuality, my sensuality. I want to just do my thing. That's callousness. Ignorance. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. You see why Paul is saying, don't walk like the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds? That's the old you. You've got to put on a new you. If we keep on reverting back to the old self, I mean, uh, the, the imagery of put off and put on is like, like the clothing that we wear. Can you imagine if you were a farmer and your daughter was getting married that day and you went out and milked the cows in the, in the barn and, and uh, you know, you, you just say, well, good enough for who it's for. Would you really go to your daughter's wedding wearing your barn chore clothes? It's unthinkable. Don't come before God with the old, dark, alienated self. Walk in newness of life. That's what he's looking for from us. They have become callous. Greedy. Okay, verse 20. But that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming that you have heard about, or heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So, 
we didn't learn when we learned of Jesus how to do things exactly the way we've always done them. We learned a new lifestyle, a new way of thinking and acting and treating one another. A new person emerges. That's what happens in our baptism, that we might walk in newness of life. And so, uh, verse 23 says, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, not the old mindset, futility of your mind, but to be renewed, be renewed and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. We are to be in Christ like our Father in heaven. A chip off the old block, if you will. Not what we were by nature. Not the old sinful self. But instead, to be reflection of God's goodness and mercy, which changes us to live in a different lifestyle. So we go on to verse 25. I have for many, many decades now thought of these words as being uh, instruction for how to fight fair. Okay, we, we're going to get in arguments with one another, but here are some of God's instructions for how to do it properly. We're not always going to see eye to eye. We, we tend by nature to clash. But if we do it God's way, there are things that tend to open us up. And when we come together, we blend and see things in the proper perspective. So that's what verse 25 and following goes on to say. Therefore, since we put off the old self and put on the new self in the likeness of God, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one speak the truth in love, speak the truth with his neighbor, where we are members one of another. So again, Paul is specifically addressing the coordinated, cooperating church, that we are members one of another. We use that terminology all the time. Do you go to church? Yes, I'm a member of First Lutheran Church. We're members. We're parts of the body. We function together. So if we're neighbors, part of the same body, the last thing we want to do is start pulling the wool over each other's eyes and telling lies and fibs to one another. Put away falsehood. Put away little white lies. Put away big, bold lies. Put away what you don't know won't hurt me lies. Put away need-to-know-only basis lies. Put all falsehood, falsehood away. And again, earlier in the chapter, speaking the truth in love. Because we are in a bonds of love with one another, we should use truth as the method of communication. And that's how to fight fear. Use truth. Verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Now ponder that one for a while. It's okay to be angry, but don't sin. Are you thinking about that? What about anger? Is anger sin? Trick question. No, it's not. It's just a, an emotion that God gave to us. So as much as laughter or joy, it's an emotion. Jesus got angry. He was pretty upset that day that he made a whip and drove the animals and the money changers out of the temple. He, uh, he, he put that across in a way that uh, he wanted to set things straight. He was angry. If anger is automatically sin, then we don't have a Savior because Jesus sinned. It's a God-given emotion. So I like to think of it this way. There's a line that God draws in the sand. And you can be angry on this side of the line as long as you don't dangle a toenail over that line because on this side, now it's, now it's wrong and now it's sinful. Be angry. It's a command, actually. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. There are times to be angry. 
to be upset with things that are going on in the world, to be upset about things that we can change and make better. But don't sin. Don't cross that line. And some of our words for sin, transgression means crossing the line. Trespass. Don't go across on the other side. Don't trespass. So be angry, but don't sin. Now, what are you thinking? Easier said than done, isn't it? Okay, let me suggest here, I want to interject something that's not specifically here. But I think it's very essential for us as Christian people to be able to identify what I call the early warning signs of anger. And think about this. When you are starting to get worked up about something and you're starting to feel the attraction of you're getting closer and closer to the line and you're thinking about, oh, now you're going to get it. We're thinking about words that we can say. We're thinking about arguments that we can win. We're thinking about different things that we can do to put that other person down to get our way across. But what on this side of the line are your early warning signs? Some people, the, the, this vein, your carotid artery, just starts to pulsate or maybe up in your forehead. Maybe you can feel that you're turning red as a beet and your palms are sweating and you're, you're kind of in a, in a posture that uh, your stomach is churning. I mean, I'm trying to describe as many ways I can think of. Learn your own signs. And when you, when you say, oh boy, I'm, I'm starting to work up ahead of steam here. If I go any farther, I know I'm going to sin. Back away. Recognize your signs early and back away. Be angry. But don't sin. Now, there's a time factor involved in this with the next verse. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Most people know, even if they don't know much about the Bible, they, they know what they think is a Bible passage. Don't go to bed angry. Well, that's not, that's not exactly how it says it. But this is pretty, pretty close. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. You know, here it is, we're well into May, a little ways into May now, and, and uh, earlier in the morning, the sun is coming up and is staying light later in the day. We're getting to a point where we can be angry longer because we haven't reached the longest day of the year yet. We can stay angry because the sun hasn't gone down yet. Now, let's not take that so literally. But today, handle it. Deal with it. Don't carry it over into the next day. For if you have to work up, a, work up that anger again, now it's not anger, now it's pride. Now it's your downfall. When we're in so intent to win every argument, that means that we've got to wound, we've got to beat down other people in order to get our way about it. And that's not the way that we learn Christ. Be angry, but don't sin. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. Handle it properly today. I met a couple years ago, and they told me the secret of their, of their happy marriage. And they said that every night before they go to bed, they would both sit on the edge of the bed, and they would say, now, did I do anything or say anything today that I'm not aware of that hurt you or, or uh, got you angry? And they would talk about it. And uh, a lot of times they would say, no, you didn't, no, nothing wrong. But when there were times that were something wrong, they talked about it and they prayed about it and it was gone. And they didn't have to wake up in the morning and say, here we go again. That's a good rule of thumb, isn't it? So we, uh, we really need to not let the sun go down on our anger because when you do, verse 27 says, you give an opportunity to the devil. Don't do that. Let's clarify something here. The devil is not one big, bad, ugly dude who's all by himself trying to create havoc in this world. When Lucifer got it in his heart 
to try to overthrow God in his rebellion. He, wasn't, he was stupid to do it, but he wasn't stupid enough to do it alone. And he went out lobbying among all the other angels, and he managed to wrangle one-third of the angels in heaven away from God to follow him. One-third of the angels. Now, that wouldn't sound so bad if, if God only made three angels. But in the book of Revelation, in chapter 5, there's a viewing of God sitting on his throne and surrounding the throne of God. It says his angels number myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. A myriad is 10,000. So if you only take one myriad times one myriad, that minimally is 100 million angels. And this is myriads of myriads. And the remainder, remember that term from arithmetic back in the day? The remainder was thousands of times thousands. So if that's what was remaining faithful to God among the angels, Lucifer took with him one-third of the angels. That means at the smallest number of evil spirits is 50 million. Now, that tells us something about Satan's ways of working. You don't want to give him an opportunity to chip away at you. Relationships that are unified are strong. But if there are little gaps in that relationship, and if, if we can drive wedges between one another, if Satan can drive wedges, or his evil spirits, they can crack us apart and cause divisions among us. And we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. So don't give an opportunity to the devil. Don't hold on to that anger and let it carry over into the next day. Do you know how to make a mountain out of a molehill? You add more dirt. Don't keep on heaping more dirt on a bad situation. Don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Get rid of it in a timely fashion. Now, verse 28 almost doesn't seem to fit in here, but let's, let's fit it in anyway. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So people who in their former life, in the futility of their minds, when they used to think nothing of stealing from people, their hands got gifted at pilfering, of shoplifting. Now God's word says, use those hands instead to do honest work so that you can create a good living for yourself. And maybe you're working so well, so hard with your honest labor that you've got enough to, to give to the food shelf to share with others who have needs. So don't go about stealing any longer, but do honest work that brings the, the best out and helps other people in their, in their needs. Verse 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. going back to our early warning system. When we're starting to chug along and say, I know what I can say that'll get at you. I know what I can say that'll put you in your place. Don't do that. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. No name calling, no undercutting, no demeaning words, but instead words that build up Words that edify, that build another person up. We were created in the image of God originally. Adam and Eve kind of took care of that one. But we still retain enough of the will of the uh, image of God that God, who is so powerful with his words, that he could say, let there be a mountain here, let there be a sun here, let there be a river and an ocean there. 
God is powerful with his words. We still retain a little bit of the image of God and that our words are so powerful, we can either build somebody up or we can break them down depending on what words come out of our mouth. I heard of a story one time of a, of a couple that uh, uh, were celebrating their 80th wedding anniversary. Can you imagine that? And uh, the old gent had already turned 100 years old, and uh, she was now turning 100 years old, and they had celebrated their 80th wedding anniversary. And so all the local media came about that day, and they said, What's the secret to your long life and your happy marriage? And the old gentleman said, Well, when we first got married over 80 years ago, we made an agreement between the two of us. If you ever, if either one of us ever gets angry with one another, before we say a word, let's just go out for a walk. I'll go on a walk if something's bothering me. You go for a walk if something's bothering you. And while we're walking, we'll think, why am I angry? What do I hope to accomplish? What should I say that makes things better? And having figured that out, then you come back and say, well, let's talk. So after we described this covenant that they had with each other for over eight years, he said, so I guess in summary, the secret to our long life and happy marriage is all the fresh air that we got. Lots of walks, lots of figuring it out, lots of, I can't say that, but I can say this. Let only words that build up come out of your mouth, that they impart grace to those who hear. And verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is, among other things, he's called the helper or the comforter. He is indeed our helper. There are times in our early warning system that we're starting to get hot and bothered by different things, and we hear a voice saying, don't go there, don't say that, don't do that. It's not always our own voice. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit who comes to us, and he's speaking to our hearts and saying, don't cross that line. He's there to protect us. You don't want to grieve him. You don't want to chain him to the fence and say, you stay here, I got to do what I got to do. Follow the leading. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit who's there to help you. <coughs> Verse 31. Okay. Here's house cleaning. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, crossing over the line anger, and clamor, that's that yippy yippy stuff that just keeps on nipping at people, and slander, let it all be put away from you with all malice. Now, we, those are the natural thoughts. But the Holy Spirit is saying, don't do that. Don't go there. Put it all away. But we don't live in a vacuum. If, you're going to, if we're going to clean house and there's an empty spot where those things used to thrive, we've got to fill them with something positive. And Paul concludes this grand chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians with three things that can fill our lives that make things go better. First of all, be kind. Be kind. Instead of winning the argument, try to think of something that's going to impart grace, something that's going to build up, something that's going to help the other person feel your kindness. Another way of saying your mercy. You could have annihilated them, but instead... You lifted them. Kindness is a very great commodity, and we are to exercise it freely and lovingly. Random acts of kindness. Have you been noticing in the local paper that uh, uh, 
people around the community are trying to make Itasca strong and in the education system to do acts of kindness. It's a good thing. But again, the real motivation comes from a Christian heart, not just from a human spirit. Be kind. Tender touch, tender words. Be tender-hearted is the second one. Now, you don't hear that word very often anymore, do you? Tender-hearted. A synonym would be compassionate. Anytime that we have a difference of opinion with somebody, we don't have any trouble whatsoever seeing our point of view. We don't, however, always look at the other person's vantage point. But compassion means that we suffer with them. We try to see more clearly, more in depth. What makes you tick? Why do you seem angry to me? What is bothering you? And if we could understand, get an insight, be compassionate, be tender-hearted toward that person and realize they've got some tremendous things going on in their life that are causing them to act as they're acting. And instead of judging them, we feel for them. Tender-heartedness is very, very great. And the third thing that we can fill our lives with is forgiveness. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And I think this is the granddaddy of them all. When we forgive one another, we can put it away. We can put it aside. We're not supposed to bury the hatchet and leave the handle sticking out for ready reference. We are to be like God. And when God established a new covenant or promised in the book of, of uh, Jeremiah, I'm going to bring a new covenant. We talked about this last week. The last of the four points of that new covenant, well, I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. That's hard to do. Somebody wrongs you. You don't have any trouble recalling that. You can remember that. But you can also choose not to bring it up. Not to draw it out again and again and again and use it as a whip against another person. We had a dear friend years ago and one of her favorite expressions, I will never forget. Boy, in the hands of the wrong person, that could be dangerous, couldn't it? I'll never forget what you did wrong. I'll never forget how you hurt me. If we instead try not to hold that against people, <clears throat> but instead use the, the measure that God uses for us, that we forgive them as God in Christ forgave us. Do you know that there's no limitation for how many times God will forgive you? Now, that doesn't mean we should do it carelessly or thoughtlessly, but whenever there is a genuine attitude about us that says, God, I am so truly truly repentant of what I did wrong. And we're seeking forgiveness from God. God never says, well, you, 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 you hit your limit. I can't give you any more grace. I can't forgive you your sins. <clears throat> when we instead come before God with an honest heart, there's always forgiveness. And that's how we're to forgive one another. Not just saying, I'm sorry, but truly giving Forgiveness. You know, the word sorry is not really in the Bible. I think there's one reference in the book of Genesis where God, depending on the translation, God was sorry that he made mankind. That was before he sent the flood. But it's never a reference in the Bible that says, this is how you get rid of conflict. You tell somebody that you're sorry. That's our weak, worldly, watered-down version of what God wants us to do. You know, our, our first parents, Adam and Eve, they both fell into sin. They both did wrong. And when God called them to account, Adam never said that he was repentant of his sins, not, at least not recorded in history. 
All he did was create what we know as the blame game. And Adam pointed his finger at God and says, well, God, I see. Yeah, you know why I sinned? It's because the woman made me sin. The woman that you gave me. So he played the blame game. If God was wrong and Eve was wrong and he was okay. That's not acceptable. Well, Eve, what have you done? Well, it wasn't me. It was that snake. We need to accept responsibility. If somebody is hurt over something that we did or said, we can't minimize our involvement in that and say, well, it wasn't that bad. I didn't really mean it. We should acknowledge that. What I did hurt you. That was not my intention. And here's what God is asking us to say. Would you forgive me? It's not just, here I am, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you misunderstood my words. I'm sorry that my, uh, what I said hurt your tender little precious feelings. Doesn't that sound genuine? But this does. What I did hurt you would you forgive me? As God in Christ forgave you, so you also must forgive. And that's where God's leading us. That's the church where we need that big bottle of excedrin to get along with one another. We need this forgiveness. We need this understanding so that we can be the coordinated and cooperating body of Christ, the church that tells the world of the salvation that God wants to give to them. Well, that brings us to the end of chapter 4. Next week, chapter 5 is just as good. I'll tell you in advance, we're going to talk about the roles and responsibilities of husbands and wives. Don't miss that one. Okay, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we all need so much change and rearranging in our lives. For all of us, it is far easier to cross the line than it is to remain at peace. For all of us, we have vivid imaginations and we know how to win wars and arguments and, and uh, how to settle things our, by our way of reckoning. But Lord God, show us a higher and better way. Show us that when we get even for somebody that's undercut us, we have to get down to that level. <clears throat> and if they pay us back, they have to get even lower. And if we get back, we get even lower. Teach us instead to take the higher ground. Show us your will and your ways. Help us to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. For Lord God, lead us onward for the unity of our faith. Lead us through your teachings, through your Holy Spirit, to be more and more and more every day that we live like our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Lord, we ask these things in his most holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Chapter 5 next week. Goodbye.